right. So, um, yeah, I think it's two pass. I think just to err on the side of uh, caution, so I know we have a lot to get through today. Uh, I think we'll kick things off. So, um, welcome everyone to the SEG Near Surface Geophysics Technical Section Student Subcommittee's webinar on eMagPy, which is part of a webinar series on open source software. Uh, the SG Near Service Student Subcommittee and myself will serve as your hosts for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation with hands-on exercises. Um, please have the software downloaded and ready per the instructions that are found on both the event website and your reminder email. We will then uh, be followed by an extended question and answer session. During the Q&A session, if you'd like to ask questions um, or even throughout the course of the presentations, if you'd like to uh, present any questions, Please um, throw them into the Q and A box at the bottom. Um, we ask that you keep them the, your questions in the Q and A box because those will actually be captured at the uh, that the course of the seminar, uh, so we can actually have access to those later. Um, but yeah, for today, uh, our presenters are Paul McLaughlin and Guillaume Blanchi. Uh, Paul McLaughlin studied geology at Edinburgh University before pursuing a PhD in hydrogeophysics with Lancaster University and the British Geological Survey. Among the tools used, uh, frequency domain electromagnetic induction was well suited for the rough terrain of the wetlands he studied. During his PhD, Paul contributed to the open source geophysical codes ResiPy and eMagPy. After his PhD, he taught hydrology in China and was postdoctoral researcher at Bordeaux University using geophysics and vineyards. He's currently a researcher at Aarhus University, where he focuses on transient EM methods in water scarce regions. Guillaume Blanchi studied bi bioengineering at the Edge University in Belgium, and then did a PhD at Lancaster University and Rothamsted Research in the UK uh, on geophysical methods to monitor root water uptake of different wheat varieties. Among them, frequency domain and electromagnetic induction was well suited for measurements during crop growth on large fields due to its high throughput thero and non-invasiveness. Guillaume contra uh, contributed to open source software eMagPy and ResiPy during his PhD. And after a year of postdoctoral research at the Flemish Research Institute for Food and Fisheries, Guillaume is now a researcher at Liège University, where he studies the effect of controlled drainage on saline freshwater interface dynamics in the Flemish polders using geophysics. So uh, I think without further ado, um, I forget Guillaume or Paul, if you ever you was starting off, but feel free to uh, share your screen and we'll get this thing going. And just a reminder everyone, uh, if you have any questions along the way, please make sure to uh, send them into uh, the Q&A box so we can get to them as things go. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. So I'll begin by sharing my screen and then we'll get started. Okay, so we'll get started then, yeah, thank you. Chris for that introduction. Um, so as Chris mentioned, we're going to be today talking about the software that Guillaume and I developed along with um, some other collaborators as well. So I think you've been getting some some uh, courses or an online seminar similar to this on Resipi and um, so Sina and Jimmy Boyd, they've also been working a little bit on this eMagPy project. So this is an overview of this presentation that we'll, we'll give today. So I'm going to give you an introduction to eMagPy, sort of the background of frequency domain electromagnetic methods, the forward models we're using in eMagPy, and then some a bit, a bit of information about file headers uh, so that we import our data correctly. And um, then Guillaume will do a demonstration of the graphical user interface. And we'll also, so we'll look at some data for some cover crop, a cover crop example then from a wetland example, and then we'll also spend some time uh, looking at some forward modeling capabilities in eMagPy. And then Guillaume will also spend some time at the end uh, using the API. So before we begin, I think, oh, we have begun. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go through this GitLab page and, and through some stuff that you can see there. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, show you the screen. Okay, so I've clicked. I've clicked on that. Uh, I've clicked on this link here, and this has taken me to this this uh, GitLab page. And here we can find uh, sort of all the source code for the eMagPy software. And we've got a nice. Um, we've got the links to the the executable files that you can download for Windows, for Mac, or for Linux. And we've also got 
a bit a little bit about the the user interface here. And we cannot see all the source code and the and the files and uh, the data files in these examples. Uh, what else do we have on this website? We have Jupyter notebooks. So this is this is tackling the e, uh, the API part of the software. So there's many examples here that you can you can check out about um, looking at various aspects of eMagpie. And the hope is that you're be able to modify these for your own data sets. So these are, these are very useful resources, in my opinion. So if you're definitely interested in using this software more, then you should check out this page. Yeah, and there's a there's two workshops here that can also be there. They tell you a lot of information about how the software is working. Um, so I think they're very useful. We also got this GitLab page, where again we've got a lot of documentation and some tutorials about how to get started with the eMagpy software. A bit about how the graphical user interface works and then the various tabs and processing steps uh, that Guillaume and I will actually cover later today in this seminar. But just so you know, these resources are out there if you want to look into it deeper uh, after the seminar is over. And we've got a gallery of examples again. Uh, showing very different, various different aspects of the software, and as I said before, hopefully these are good templates for you to adapt uh, your own data to, and and start to play around with uh, your data and invert it, and so on. Okay, so I hope that there was no problems downloading the the GUI. Well, I guess I think it's interesting to talk a little bit about the rationale behind the behind why Gil and I actually started this this project. So. We initially developed this during our PhDs. Yeah, sorry. We we had, we started this during our PhDs, and we were working on other uh, frequency domain EM codes, and we were a bit confused about how they were working. So we sort of started looking into the forward models, and then at the end of it, we had quite a nice collection of forward models and inversion codes uh, based in Python, to, so we could model our own data. And we thought, well, how about we we develop this a little bit further and develop a nice uh, wrapper so that hopefully it can be useful to other people. So the, they were our PhDs. So I think I was, I was not in here, was looking at cover crop and uh, basically using this device here. This is the mini explorer from, from GF Instruments. Whereas I was looking more at groundwater surface water interaction. So this is a, a, mining, a mining site where there was some discharge of some acid lead acid water. So that, that was part of the applications we were using. And of course, these are two different instruments that we can use to characterize the subsurface. As I said, the hope for the software is that um, other people would use it and find it useful and actually do their own do research and uh, process their own data. And there's been quite a few interesting examples, I would say, in the last, last few years for this paper. From Nagar and others in 2021, they were interested in characterizing sandbar deposits in the Ohio River. And they, that what we sort of identified in this, this sandbar deposit was some uh, gravelly or coarser units in the middle of the in the middle of the sandbar. Similarly, the, the Italian group are working on the software as well, using the software. We've been uh, mapping glacial sediments in the in the dolomites, and they got a nice example here where they attributed the very low conductive unit in blue to um, some uh, frozen frozen soil. So, and Gilman and I are very happy that people are using the software, and we're very happy to be invited on this uh, seminar. So, eMagpy. Uh, let's look at it from a workflow point of view. So this is when we were designing it, we were kind of thinking about, okay, what what's most makes most sense in order to process and invert the data? So we, it's kind of split into five main chunks, the, the software. So we've got a forward modeling section where we can um, generate a synthetic model that we see in this figure here. We can then generate a forward model response from that and get some synthetic ECA data, parent conductivity data. Um, in the case of field data, so this is a, a plot of some field data, we can actually import field data and we can visualize it as a, a simple line plot. And we can identify where we've got erroneous measurements. So we can see here there's a, a peak in this value here. Or we can also plot this as map data. So I think this is very useful when we're 
we're looking at raw data to to sort of see what's going on in the in the patterns of the data. There's a few filtering steps that we can do in the in the eMagpie as shown here, and we'll look at that later today. And we can also do some calibration and uh, error modeling with the with the eMagpie, and then of course invert the data. So we translate the raw frequency domain EM measurements into inverted results. So depth specific models of electrical conductivity. Or oh, maybe this was in the wrong order kind of, but let's let's take a, a step back and actually look at the frequency domain electromagnetic instrument. So all frequency domain instruments, they comprise of at least, uh, or they comprise of one transmitter coil indicated uh, here. I hope you can see my cursor. If you look at figure A, you can see this TX, this is the transmitter coil. And then they all a magnetic field. What we do is we pass a current around this transmitter coil at a certain frequency. This induces a response in the subsurface, which creates these eddy currents in the subsurface and they generate a secondary electromagnetic field. Now this, the secondary and the primary electromagnetic field are then um, measured by the receiver coil and we can use the ratio of the primary and the secondary electromagnetic fields to infer information about the subsurface electrical conductivity. Um, yeah, so as I said, they will consist of one transmitter and at least one receiver. So in this figure at the bottom, this is a, a multi-coil or a multi-receiver instrument. And we've got a single transmitter and three receiver coils. And those three receiver coils are incrementally larger distances. So that means that we can actually infer information over different footprints. So as we increase the dis distance between the transmitter and the receiver coil, we can actually see deeper into the subsurface. And this is a, a fundamental part of the, of the inversion process. So we need to collect data that has different sensitivity frequencies. And another thing that we can do to modify the, the sensitivity footprint of these instruments actually is to change the frequency. So we have some um, frequency domain electromagnetic instruments that are multi-frequency. And we can also change the orientation. So if a coil is if both coils are horizontal or if both coils are vertical, this will change the depth of investigation of our instrument. And of course, um, the separation distance between the transmitter and the receiver. So AMAGPI is an inversion software. So in order to invert data, we need to have an accurate forward model. So we need to be able to compute a theoretical response for a, a given distribution of subsurface electrical conductivity. So we can see in the, in the conceptual model here, this is a, a synthetic model, if you like. And that synthetic model will, will have a, a forward model response based on some uh, parameters of the frequency domain coil. So the orientation, the coil separation, um, and the height above the, above the subsurface, these are all important factors in dictating what the expect of res expected response of a, a conceptual subsurface is. Um, so eMagpie is using two, two groups of forward models, I would say. So the first one is a, a full solution forward model, and that's based on Maxwell's uh, equations. But it's also capable of using the uh, linear simplification forward model. Yeah, called the cumulative simplification forward model. And that was, that was uh, proposed by um, the geonics manufacturer, Canadian geonics manufacturers. In the 1980s or so. And the nice thing about this cumulative sensitivity for model is it's very quick. So this can be you know, computed very rapidly. Okay. So if we go back to the full solution, the output of the full solution is actually a, a quadrupal value. So actually, I'll skip back. So if we think about the ratio of the, the primary and the secondary electromagnetic field, this is a complex number because we can see that um, there's a, lag, a phase lag between the two, two fields, and there's also an amplitude difference. So if we do the ratio of those two fields, we'll get a complex number. 
And then um, frequent to the main EM were actually interested in the imaginary com component or the quantum component. So this full solution for model will give us a quadrature measurement. Now that quadrature measurement um, is actually quite difficult to conceptualize because it's in, in a very small unit or very large units. So what it tends to be done in frequency domain EM is it's translated into an apparent conductivity. And this is very similar to the apparent resistivity in, uh, in DC resistivity. So this apparent conductivity is the equivalent quadrature conductivity to a homogeneous earth. So if say we had a quadrature val value of, of X, the EC will be the, will be the equivalent homogeneous conductivity of the subsurface that would also give that same X of quadrature. And eMagPi considers two ways of converting quadrature to apparent electrical conductivity. So the first one is a low induction number approximation. And this is, this is nice, this is just a, a linear transform of quadrature. And that's used by a lot of manufacturers to get to, to get from quadrature values to ECA values. Another approach that, uh, that, that can be done, uh, which gives a kind of more robust estimate of ECA or a more robust value of ECA is to minimize the difference between a, a target quadrature, so the measured uh, field measured quadrature or the, or the forward model response quadrature, this value here, and minimize the difference between that and a, and a quadrature calculated for a, a homogeneous subsurface. And we refer to that in uh, eMagPi as equivalent or the full solution equivalent ECA. Yeah, so that's the that's the sort of four model components of eMagPy. And of course, it's important to really understand what we're doing at each of these steps, because it's important that uh, the ECA values computed by our forward model is matching the ECA values uh, recorded by the device. Because it, it's important that these values match to ensure the most accurate inverted model. In the case of the of the field data, we'll have this. Say this is the true subsurface. We'll collect some raw data, and that tends to be expressed in a in a quadrature value, or as I mentioned before, it's generally it can be uh, converted into a apparent conductivity using this low induction number approximation. So you see some devices. So I think the, the GEM two, for example, will give you a, a value in quadrature, whereas uh, the Geonics uh, devices will give you a value in apparent conductivity and the GF, GF instruments, they will also give you value in uh, apparent electrical conductivity. And um, I think I'm just spending time to stress this, this concept because I, I think it's, um, it's very important that we invert data using the same forward model as the data is collected. Yeah, so if there's any questions about that, in, we, we can address that later on. Yeah, then I also mentioned that I'm going to talk about the file format. So as I said, the sensitivity of the instrument is related to the coil orientation. So the orientation of the coils with respect to the ground, the spacing between the transmitter and the receiver coil, the frequency of the coil, and it's actually also influenced by the height above the ground. Um, so if you've got data, uh, data that you want to load into eMagPy, the header of each column should be should have this information in it. So we can see some examples of headers here for your, your data columns. So this one means that the coils are in vertical coal planar orientation. They've got a 0 0.32 meter separation distance. They operate at, at 30,000 hertz and they are located on the ground surface. So that is a, that's a measure, that's what the measurement Guillaume was using a lot in his um, agricultural study site. This next one is a different orientation of the coils. And this time we've got a 1.18 meter separation between the two coils. And we've got a excitation frequency of 10,000 Hertz. And the device is elevated one meter above the ground. Yeah. 
and you can also have this additional suffix um, in the in the in the header. So, for example, we can can establish if it's in phase data or quadrature data in in uh, PPT parts per thousand. But the the default value expected by EMAGPI will be this apparent electrical conductivity. Um, yeah, so this is just some other examples of some input data. The EMAGPI will recognize latitude and longitude and elevation, and these are the and some coil specifications, and then some apparent conductivity measurements here. We can also simply put an XY location in, in meters. And elevation and again the coil specifications of the of the measurement. Um, yeah. So, in human eye's opinion, I think this this graphical user interface is, is designed to sort of simplify the modeling process and, and guide the user through each step uh, to hopefully get useful results for whatever their application is. Um, yeah. So I think it's better if. If we actually just explore that together, and Guillaume's going to do that in a few minutes. But there's many, many things you can do with the software. You can uh, you can apply a rolling mean. You can delete some uh, erroneous data, um, and then there's some of the other tiles. We can calibrate the data. We can look at the errors. We can define our starting model for an inversion, and we can invert the data, and then we can look at the, the misfit of the of the data to, to see how well our model fits our measured field data. Oops. Um, also, so we've got the GUI, but we've also behind the GUI is this application programming interface. And this is this will be this is based in Python essentially. And then um, this allows you a bit more flexibility with what you want to do. Uh, so if you want to look through many surveys or if you want to try many different regularizations. So if you want to try different smoothing values, or if you want to try uh, different uh, parameterizations of the of the starting model, you, know, you can very easily do that in the API. Yeah. So um, maybe if we go, I think if we go into the, the GUI now, I think uh, Guillaume is going to take over and share his screen and, and talk about uh, the cover crop example. So I'll, I'll switch over to Guillaume now and you can do that. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Paul. Um, just before I go into that, just there was a question for uh, in the chat for um, is the, yeah. the, the meeting recorded? Not just like a general question, but I think it's for Christopher or, or Louis. Yeah, it is recorded. I think. It's recorded. So I think it's going to be available afterwards. Uh, so I will back to that. Okay, cool. And um, I share my screen. And here we go. Right. So, um, yeah, as Paul said, and I think you already have the link uh, in the stuff, you can download uh, the code, you can download the compile one, but you can also just git clone the code, so download uh, 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 the source code of it. And this is what I've done. Uh, you can just clone it and download, and download it. Um, and so, uh, what I do afterwards, because I'm going to run the code from, from source, uh, I'm actually going to open my Python prompt. Here, I just use WinPython, but if you have like a Conda installation, it's going to be the same process. I just open WinPython. I will navigate uh, to the location of the, of the EMACPI folder. Okay, so this I'm the EMACPI folder, the folder that I've downloaded. And actually here, uh, you can see I have the same structure as I have on the, on the GitLab. So with the different folders, if I want to run it, I need to go into the SRC folders from the source, and then I can run Python UI.py. All these instructions uh, actually here. So you can just follow this page uh, to, to get the software downloaded if you want to run it from source. Okay, right, so I'm running it. All right, so this is how it looked like. Um, I'm just gonna put it here. Yeah, it's perfect. Right, and as Paul said, so um, 
what we had in mind when we designed the Magpie is was basically to, to make our, uh, our process easier of processing EMI data. And what we wanted to do was really to try to get a model of the, of the ground subsurface. So basically to do an inversion lag for ERT. Because there's a lot of people also just using uh, EMI um, instruments of frequency domain EMI just to get maps, an idea of the maps uh, around the around the area. Uh, and it's a very good instrument for that. Uh, but if you want to go a bit further, if you want, for instance, in my case, to like look at the water uptake of, of different type of varieties of wheat, it's important to basically try to invert the data to build a, a model of the ground electrical conductivity. Uh, and so the software is designed to go from taps to taps, from left to right. It's a very, very similar interface to, uh, to RESTiPy. And I think I just, at some point, we should just copy past the code and then uh, modify it a bit uh, to do that. Um, how for, I mean, um, but what is different between uh, RESTiPy and, and EMACPy is that's uh, really EMACPy is just focusing on, on 1D inversions of, of the MI data. Uh, so we don't do... Uh, real 3D, we just do pseudo 3D or pseudo 2D with some constraints. And that's the first thing. And also we designed it firstly just with the with the API in mind. And then afterwards came the, the graphical user interface. Okay, um, so I'll start with uh, showing you a survey that's been collected on an experiment trying different type of color crops. So I start with the importing tabs and I can import uh, my data sets. There is by default some uh, examples that are given you when you download the software. So I'm this, this one, I'm gonna use it. So I have a cover crop example here. And in this cover crop example, I'm gonna choose the first CSV file. The CSV file is formatted just as Paul said with different headers, uh, an X and a Y columns and so on. So I can import this. And then directly I have an overview of the data here. Uh, it's actually just a matplotly plot. You can interact with the plot if you want to zoom in. Uh, you can, you can just go back to the house. Uh, to the zoom version that was before. Uh, you can pan as well here uh, if you want. You can save also the, the figures. And by default, it's showing it as a distance, but actually in our case, uh, these are just samples that have been collected on different plots. So I prefer just to show the sample like that as dots. You can see that I have the six different call configurations here, uh, VCP 032, 71, and 18, and then all the HCP calls. Uh, I can decide just to show one of the calls or just to show them all, depends. Um, some useful thing here that you can find is, uh, so if for instance, you've imported a survey that had quadrature and you want to convert it to a linear, so low induction number approximation ECA, uh, this is what you can use. If you have a survey as well, when you have uh, latitude longitude data and you want to basically project them to your local um, CRS, you can do it as well here. Uh, in our case, in this data set, it's already projected as a per plot data set, so uh, don't need that. Looking at these data sets, there is some outliers uh, that you can see there. And so you can either remove the outliers by setting a, a maximum value, so everything above 100, and I can apply this, I remove them. Uh, but you can also, if you want, uh, just click on this, and it's going to remove all the dots, uh, so all the measurements associated with this location. So not just this one, but all of them. So for instance, I can also do that, select the points and delete the selected points. Um, if you have like 2D data, you can also grid the data. That's uh, also possible. And what I'm gonna do for this one as well, you can uh, apply a rolling mean. And if you apply a rolling mean, it can smooth it out uh, a bit like this. So you can view it like this as a, as a series of, of data points, but you can also do uh, show it as a map. And this is an example of a map. These dots appear because I've done the running mean. So this, uh, this is it. You can apply the contour. You can also show the points. Um, and so if I just go through the code, so this is the shallowest code, the 032, and I'm gonna go to the other codes to a bit deeper. You can already see that we have like a structure when we have an area here which is uh, lower electrical conductivity and then an area here which is a bit higher electrical conductivity. And as we go deeper, uh, you can see that this structure remains and then the higher conductivity starts to uh, grow a bit. If you like, you can change the color scale. Um, you can do rainbow, but I want to buy it because it's not very color friendly. Um, it's also possible to export it as a georeference TIFF. So if you want, you can after import it into a QGIS, for instance, if you want to create maps and so on. 
Um, and then you can, of course, uh, I mean, adjust the scale here as well. Um, for that. So that's all here. It's all processing. I mean, it's all um, a display you can do with the apparent conductivity. So just to get an overview, to get a map or to get a profile and so on uh, for that. Okay. And so I'm going to go tap per, per tap. The ERT calibration tab, I'm going to leave it to Paul because he has an example afterwards um, as well for the error modeling. So I'm going to directly go to the inversion settings. So here we're going to design uh, the type of model we want to, to have after inversions. So for instance, I mean, what I always do, I always start with a smooth model, for instance. So I'm going to start with a model with maybe uh, 20 layers um, with a thickness of 0.1 layers, and it can start at at 20 millisiemens per meter, this is fine. And so here you have a bit of an idea of what the model, uh, I mean, of the different layers. So you have layer one, for instance, that the bottom of the layer one is at 0.1 from the surface. The, la the bottom of oh, well, layer two, the bottom of layer two is at 0.2 from the surface. These depths are fixed. And then they have a starting electrical conductivity of 20 millisiemens per meters. This also you can change if you want. And you can decide to fix it. So if you have knowledge, for instance, that's uh, on your field, you have a layer that you know exactly the conductivity and it's very continuous, you can decide to, to fix it uh, in the model. As we're going to do a smooth model, what we do is that we fixed, we have a lot of, uh, of layers. We have 20 layers. Okay. We fixed uh, the depth and we leave the conductivity to change. It's going to produce a, a smooth model. Um, what you can also do is fit an L curve. So um, an L curve is basically going to be, I'm going to do it actually, right? It's going to be a curve that looks like this. Uh, here it's plotted in linear scale, but some people can plot it also in log scale, depends a bit. It's just show the ratio, uh, I mean, the relationship between the model misfits and the data misfits. And ideally, if you want to choose your regularization parameters, uh, you look at uh, the elbow of the curve in the corners with around 0 0.13, 0 0.007. Uh, that you can do. Um, some people like to use it, some people don't like it, so I won't, I won't go too much in details uh, for that, but it gives you a bit of an idea of the range of value that you need to use for your uh, regularization parameters, so that's the, uh, the smoothing parameters as well. Okay, let's go to the inversion taps. Right, so inversion taps, we have if I go from left to right, you first have this uh, drop down menu that shows the different forward models. So, as Paul has explained before, it's very important to know what uh, the ECA you've obtained from your instrument comes from. Where does it come from? Usually, it comes from basically the low induction number approximation, so FS, FS lin in this case. Um, but it can you can also just have the quadrature or get something uh, some, something else, right? Uh, you also have the first model, which is the cumulative sensitivity function of McNeil. And this one, the advantage is that it's very, very fast. Uh, and if your instrument has basically recording data when it was on the ground, so not at one meter, for instance, but really on the ground, uh, and at, if you are in a condition when it's, the conductivity is not too high, so below 100 millisiemens per meter, uh, you can safely use the cumulative sensitivity function. Uh, for this kind of, of stuff, at least as a first to get the first idea of what the model looked like. So what I will do here, uh, I will use the cumulative sensitivity first, uh, and then I can afterwards switch to FSLIN, which is basically how the device has been recording the, the data. And then we have the second drop-down menu, and you can see each time I put my mouse over it, there is a little bit of a helper that appears. Um, it shows you the type of solver you can use. Uh, and I don't want, don't want to go into too much detail because um, all, I mean, most of these solver come actually from the SpotPy package, the Python package that enables different type of solder. There's also some solver for, uh, from, um, from SciPy Optimize from the Python package. By default is uh, this one, LBFGSB, which it's a lot of name from uh, people that I don't remember. Um, it's quite good, so it's a general default one that can that can help. Then we got the vertical smoothing, so 0 0.07. Actually, uh, that's yeah, it's, it's this one is a bit close to the elbow uh, of the L curve one. Uh, you can change that if you put something very high. It's gonna basically make it um, 
smoother. If you put something low, you're gonna try to overfit and you might also fit a bit uh, of the noise. You can add a lateral smoothing factors. Uh, for instance, if you have been doing a transect uh, if you, uh, with, with your instruments, uh, you can actually add a bit uh, of lateral smoothing in order to constrain the profile that are next to each other. In this case, the data set was collected on plots and uh, the plots were not near each other, so I would not add any lateral smoothing. You can choose the type of regularization, L2 or, or L1, and then there is a uh, type of iteration as well. And if you want to run it uh, in parallel, that's also possible. So let's just have a look. So I'm going to invert it. Uh, you can see that it's actually show you the, the progress of the inversions. If you've loaded several surveys, you can also see uh, how it goes. With the cumulative sensitivity, it goes relatively quick, but if you have like uh, the FST or the FSCQ, it will take more time, of course. Once it's finished, and it's finished quicker than I talk, uh, you will get this interface with three tabs. The first one shows you the profile. So this is the profile of uh, inverted connectivity. In this case, it's not distance, but it's really the, the sample that we have. And uh, if you remember a bit in the importing tab, what it looked like, we had four lines and you have like actually the first line and then we went back to the beginning, the second line, third line and fourth line. And so you have this really the structure with the, the, conductiv the higher conductivity that you can find below that we saw actually uh, in the map. A bit similar to the rest, uh, you can also like uh, adjust the color scale uh, if you like. Uh, you can plot a contour. Uh, in this case, it's, because it's not really a transect, but really like four transects, it might not be entirely correct. You can change the color scale. Um, yeah. And you can also save the results uh, in a file. Uh, so um, I can show this actually. So if you save the results, If you, so if you want afterwards, for instance, to extract um, transect, sorry, to extract profiles uh, from this, or if you want to plot specific uh, specific depth, you can actually open this. I mean, save the result and open this file, and in this file you can find x and y columns, as we said, and then you have layer one up to layer 20, and then you have the depth of layer one up to layer 19. Up to layer 19, you noticed. We don't have a depth for the layer 20 because the last layer is actually going to minus infinity. So that makes sense. Uh, and here you have the values uh, of the inverted conductivity. Okay, I'll go back to that value. Um, you can also plot a slice. So in this case, we have a 3D model, right? And so we have 20 layers and you can actually go down. So I go down my model and I can plot the inverted electrical conductivity. Uh, I can also do a, a contour plot and you can see actually that we'll obtain the same structure as, as we've seen in the apparent uh, conductivity, which is very good because if you see something else, that means that probably your inversion, there is something wrong. Yeah. Uh, as well, you can adjust the color scale, save the results. You can also export it to a, a, a GIS layers uh, for that. We also have a tab for the 3D view. Uh, it's actually a bit fancy. It's using the PyVista Python package, uh, which works with a VTK file format. It's very powerful. Um, and then what you can do as well, you can uh, apply the VMin, VMAX. You can put a threshold. Uh, you can put a threshold. So for instance, if you want to uh, show everything uh, with about 30, you can see I only can, I can crop my model. Uh, for those who use uh, Paraview, this is very similar. It's, it does, you don't have all the options that you have in Paraview, of course. Huh? Um, you can also uh, slice the model. So you can apply the grid and slice the model. So if I do. One, you get one slice in the middle. Um, and then you can get one slice like this. Yeah. Or it's very sharp. Yeah. But you get the idea. Um, you can also put either surface. So 
So instance, if we know that we have this, uh, this blue maybe is a clay layer and we know that it's conductivity about, about 40, we can just uh, apply an ISO surface to show the conductivity here uh, in a 2D. Uh, if you want, we can also do several of them. And then we have like different, uh, yeah, different ISO surface for uh, equal conductivity. Okay, time is running. So uh, we go to the next step, the misfit tab. Uh, there we have two figures. On the left, we have actually the, um, the measurements with the electrical conductivity, uh, the apparent one that is measured and the one that is modeled. So basically if the dot falls on the triangles, uh, as is most of the time the case, maybe not here completely and not here, uh, it means that it's well fitted. Here, I think it's quite a, quite a good fit. Uh, and on the right, we have actually uh, just a one-one plot. So we compare all the observed apparent conductivity with the simulated, and we have an RMS, RMSPE, the percentage misfit, um, for these ones. If they follow all on the one-one line, this is really good. If you see that, for instance, maybe all your HTTP calls are going far off from this line, then there's probably there is something uh, wrong with the with the, the data collection. And then this is why the ERT calibration might be important. If you, if you go further, there is a help as well. There is a help tab uh, when you can find some of these figures uh, as well for the forward model, how to choose your forward model with this uh, data inputs, how to input the data, the calibration, and, and some settings on the inversions uh, for that. So I will invite you, there's a first help. There is more online, uh, but if you have really a quick, uh, if you don't know how what the option and so on, you can have a look at this. Uh, and the help out tab just lists all the Python package uh, we are using. And uh, it says that basically MacPy is, is a sister code of, of Recipe and some, some of our contributors, Jimmy, Sina, and Martin. So I think that's it for me. So um, at least for, for the cover crop example. So Paul, you can take back the hand. So we do have a few um, questions in the chat if you want to or in the uh, Q&A. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK. Wait. So um, let's see if you could. To kind of talk through again how you extracted the um, Excel file with all the inverted data. How did I extract the Excel file? So for to get the Excel file, um, okay, okay, wait. To get the Excel file, so after I've run the inversion, basically I end up with this profile, and then basically I save the results. And when I save the results, this is saving my uh, my Excel file with the the inverted data. Um, and so this is the one that look look like this when you have the layers and then the depth a bit further away. I hope that replies the question. Yep. Um, we have someone asking about doing EM data analysis by wavelet transform. Um, not sure there's much of a question in there, but uh, yes. Yeah. Well, EMACPI cannot do that. <laughs> that's the that's the answer. The the, the response. Um, basically, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't say the contrary. But uh, this is something more like if you want to run the codes, you can maybe use EMACPI to do like some comparison with the API and then do uh, with the with that transform. But in the GUI, you cannot do it. All right. Um, also asking, could EMACPI invert uh, VLF data if given as real and imaginary parts? Good question. So um, EMACPI is limited just to the to the. Um, the imaginary part, so just it just invert the quadratures in terms of ECA. It does not consider the in phase, uh, so it's a very important point. We actually compute internally the in phase, but we don't use it uh, during the inversions. Um, if you want to invert uh, to do one inversion with both the in phase and the quadrature, I think there is other codes uh, open source. There is like FDM1D that can do it. I think Femix can do it as well. Um, so if if you're interested, uh, I can just put the link in the chat for that. Um, for that, but EMACPI is just limited to to electrical conductivity uh, only. Of course, if you are interested to develop it, this because we actually compute it, develop it into EMACPI into contiguous, you are welcome. Yeah, it's, it's ma mainly built for these uh, ground conductivity meters, so with the with the small offsets. So I'm not sure how it would work with VLFs or how it could be modified to to work with VLF transmitters. But yeah. Interesting to explore. I don't know. I think we'll quickly just run through a couple more before switching back over. Um, for the misfit plots, would it be possible to plot the difference between the observed and the modeled? Uh, data? Yeah, that, 
Yeah, that's that's what the misfit plot uh, is showing. Uh, actually, you have on the um, on the, on the um, you can share it screen again. Thank you. I think maybe if like to show the absolute difference between the modeled and the misfit, like the the one minus the other, effectively. Ah well, in, okay. That. Yeah, I see. Yeah, in MacPy you cannot, but actually, if you go into the API, this you yeah. can easily do. Huh? It's very easy to do in the API. So um, yeah, you cannot do everything in the in the grid. At some points, you need to go to to the API um, to if you want to more to do more advanced figures and so on. Yeah. All right. I think um, in the interest of time, maybe we'll, um, Paul, head back over to you, just kind of go through your stuff and we come back to the questions closer towards the end. Mm. Yes. And in the meantime, um, you even know, uh, you had mentioned about dropping some links to um, some of the other codes for like VLF data. Um, people have said that, that that would be nice if you could do that. Yeah, as Guillaume said, I'm going to now talk about the the ERT calibration. So first I'm going to go through the GUI and we'll see what happens if we don't calibrate the data. Uh, and then and then we'll see what happens if we do calibrate the data. Uh, so I'll get the I'll get the GUI up now. And then if but I'm I'm not sure but if I, we have resolution issues, maybe Chris or, or Guillaume can, can tell me if they can see it. I could have loaded it in advance. I got 20 minutes to this one. But it's pretty quick, so it'll be the instant. I uh, just maybe explain what uh, why the calibration is, is needed and when when it's not. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah, I see. So uh, I think this is a a, a common feature of frequency domain electromagnetic instruments is that they are they can be prone to drift and they're they're sensitive to you know, a temperature of in the air, and then, uh, and also the 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 way they're manufactured, there can be slight differences in the in the coil, in the, the coil makeup. So quite often, manufacturers apply some sort of calibration to the to the data. Um, what Guillaume and I found in our in our studies is that in in many cases that this uh, calibration can be a little bit off sometimes, and this is. This is due to normal normal uh, wear and tear of the instrument, I suppose. Like sometimes instruments can go off off the calibration and they, and they need to be reset. Um, and actually, this so this ERT calibration was uh, was developed by I think it was I'm not sure maybe Glenn who can search the paper and we'll, we'll give it a look at it. I can remember maybe the mid 2000s. So he was proposing that we we collect ERT at the same time as EM data on the same transect, and we compute the forward model response for the ERT model, and we can use that to actually calibrate the our EM instrument. So this this example is looking at uh, that process, which is facilitated in in the Um So yeah, I'm just going to drag over. If I put it full screen, does that, does that look too small? Maybe. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share just the window, I think. Yeah, so that can be better, I think. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. OK. So for this, we're going to look at a, a data set collected from a, a wetland. And this is a wetland in the, in the south of England. Um, so we're going to first import this ECA raw, and again we're faced with the same plot that that Gail was that Gail was showing us. Um, for this instrument, so this is using a, a device called the GF uh, Explorer, and they the the GF Explorer they have their own sort of calibration that they've calibrated uh, on their test site for when the device is operated at one meter above the ground. So we want to make sure that the ECA values uh, computed by our forward model are the same as the ECA values collected by the instrument. So what we're going to do here is press this, do this F one meter calibration, and then we're going to convert that into back into low induction number ECA. 
And if you take a look at this scale here, you will see that the numbers actually drop down quite a lot. Yeah. And then, so now, before it was going from some, uh, 0 to 40 or something like this, and now it's going from 10 to 15. Yeah. And the reason the reason that they, they give this calibration is effectively because it, it is good for when you're producing maps of the subsurface. So if you're just walking around with the instrument and you want to produce 2D spatial maps of the, the subsurface, then this calibration is quite nice. The GF calibration is quite nice because it, it shows a lot of variability across the field. We are wanting to translate this data into quantitative measurement um, models of electrical conductivity. So we want to make sure that the, the ECA values collected by the instrument are matching the forward model in the inversion software. Um, yeah, so just now we'll do without the without the calibration just to see how it looks. And we'll put, uh, let's put eight, eight layers. Uh, yeah. And we'll just do with, uh, with the default, uh, default vertical smoothing and we'll do with Gauss-Newton minimization because it's quite quick. Yeah, so this is the profile we're faced with. Um, yeah. And what we can see is uh, the values are running from zero to around about uh, 40 or 50. And we can actually see a, a, a two layer structure in the state. So we've got a resistor in the bottom and then a more conductive unit on the top. Um, and we can see that this conductive unit actually. Towards the, towards the this side of the profile. And this actually corresponds quite well with some uh, intrusive peak measurement, the thickness of peak measurement. So this data is quite nice actually in terms of uh, interpreting it for the hydrogeology of the site. But it, in summary, what we see is that the, the peak thickens towards um, the right hand side of the profile. And that, that matches well with intrusive measurement. Anyway. What we're going to do now is look at this misfit plot, which is what Guillaume just looked at. Um, and for his one, the, the, the observed and the simulated apparent conductivities were quite similar to each other. Um, but what we actually see in this plot, uh, I think it's auto, it auto scales, actually, this is maybe something we need to think about, but it's auto scaled to not to show the whole plot. But uh, I don't know if you can see that, but we have a lot of these. Uh, these uh, points they are off of the the one to one line. Yeah. So what the, this is the shallow most coil for the device. So this is the vertical coplanar, one point four eight. So this is the this is the measurement that has the shallowest depth of investigation. So that is particularly prone to to poor calibration or, or drift. Um, so that's not really fitting very well with the the model. So the observed apparent conductivity and simulated apparent conductivity are, are pretty different. Um, yeah, so we can see this is six and a half down here compared to 10.2 or something. So that's quite a big shift. Yeah. Um, okay. So then what we're going to do is actually calibrate the data. So I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint uh, now. And, and we'll, we'll look at that. We'll look at some of the uh, some of the file inputs for the how we do the calibration. Yeah. So this ERT calibration uh, tab is on is on the is on the is the core tab. Yeah. So it's loading in the back of the book or in the foreground. Well, we've got three tabs in this ERT calibration. We've got an uh, ECA raw, and that's this uh, data that's been collected along the ERT transect. Uh, and that has the format as a, the same as we import the raw data, except in this X column, we've got distance along this ERT profile that we're going to use to calibrate the data. 
but then again, the same, the same header information as before. So all of the, the orientation, the separation distance, and the frequency uh, of all secular measurements. Uh, we're also then going to need to load uh, a model of electrical um, conductivity from the ERT model. Uh, and that has the format of this, actually. So this is maybe a little bit unintuitive, but what we've got here is we've got uh, the depth of the model in the top in the header, so down from 0 0.03 meters all the way down to 6.1 meters. And we've got the conductivity in millisiemens per meter at each location along the along the calibration line. So for every position of these, these, these measurements, the ECU measurements, the, the frequency domain EMI measurements, we've got a corresponding ERT uh, vertical column. Um, Actually, eMagPy also works by importing an ERT model. So I'm not sure if Sina has explained how to ex export models from Resipy, but actually in theory, what we can do is we can import an ERT model from, from Resipy. Um, yes, and maybe you're familiar with this emblem, but when you export a model from um, Resipy, We've got the X and Y coordinates of, of each pixel from the, the ERT model. And then we've got the resistivity in this column and the log 10 transform resistivity. So we can actually import that. Oops. We can actually import that into this eMagPy software as well in order to do the calibration. And we're going to again, again back to the, the software now. Um, yep. Where is it gone? Hiding. Am I? No, I'm not sure. Okay, that's working. So again, as before, we're going to import the, the data set. So we're going to import the first data set. Um, now, in theory, what we could do, we could have a, a whole survey across uh, collected across a big field. We could import that, and then we could just use this calibration line to calibrate the entire data set. So it doesn't need to be that the, the model space is only along the ERT line. Of course, we could have a big survey over a big field and we could then use the ERT calibration defined for that one concept and apply it to all of the data. Yeah. So we'll apply this, this calibrate, this is the conversion, and then we'll import this, this uh, concept. Um, and we'll import the EC model. Uh, all of these are in the in the CD. And we're gonna do an FS lin and we're gonna fit the calibration. Yeah. And what we can see here is that the the, the the apparent conductivities collected by the instrument are actually quite different from those computed from the resistivity model. Um so in general, the apparent conductivity of the device, they are much higher than, than what would be expected for the same model with the ERT device, for the same surface, subsurface. So we're going to apply this calibration to transform this data and calibrate this data. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same sort of model, eight layers, half a meter spacing, and we're going to invert the data and take a look at what it looks like. Okay. 
So, so I'm not sure if you if you remember before that the values were are, were quite higher before, but actually we see a same same sort of structure. So we've got a lower resistivity layer, uh, sorry, a lower conductivity layer and a higher conductivity layer above. Um, and then we can use that for other observations. So if we had some some boreholes or some some soil augering, we could actually call it, correlate that with the, the soil type or the the structure at the field site. Um, importantly, now we're going to look at the mist bit, but so now now what we can see here is the overall mist bit is is lower. So I think before it was around two and a half percent or so. But let's also look at these uh, offsets. So it's a bit auto automatically this uh, the legend is a bit in the way, but what we can see actually is that the simulated and the observed are now much closer to each other. So they're all a lot closer to this this one to one. Um, it's good. It gives us more confidence in our in our inverted electromagnetic model. Yeah. So I'll stop sharing now. I think, and that maybe I've got some more. More, more slides. Thank you. I can't remember. Oh no, I actually I don't know any more slides. So I think we can we can have some some questions again. Maybe it'd be a good time for some questions. That's good. Yeah. Um, Gima, see, you've been uh, hard at work answering um, a good yeah. amount of them. Yeah, I found my best. Uh, see here. Um, Sin was asking, um, so that feature or that, that, um, parameter to convert to, uh, the low induction number, uh, for connectivity, uh, he's asking, is that only for the GF Explorer? So, yes. Yeah. Oh, you want to answer? Go, go for it. Um, yes. So this F0 and F1 meter, they are only for the, the GF Explorer. But actually, some devices, so the GEM2, will give you a, a, a value in quadrature. Uh, and in that case, you might want to translate this to apparent conductivity. Um, the geonics instruments, they will give you a value in low induction number apparent conductivity. So I think the safest thing to do is to kind of look at the, the manual for these instruments and kind of try and make sure that you understand what's going on with the, the calibration and, and how they've actually arrived at these apparent conductivities. Because then that will ensure that we can get the nicest answers or the most accurate answers is more correct way of saying it, more ac most accurate models from the frequency domain electromagnetic instrument. Um, so I keep going, uh, can it be used for mineral exploration? So, I guess in theory, so Guillaume and I are mainly doing critical zone stuff, so environmental things, but in, in theory, I think for, for most mineral explorations, I think they're mostly interested in uh, signatures. So it's not so much, the nice thing about eMagpie is it gives us a vertical distribution of electrical conductivity. So for with mineral exploration, I think the main, main thing of interest would be uh, lateral changes. Which you could achieve just with a simple style mapping. And um, yeah, of course, the depth of these mineral deposits will it's going to vary. And um, yeah, but I think yeah. So I think for yeah, I hope that answers the question. Can it determine lithology? So yeah, this is a this is actually a an interesting point of why we we actually want to invert the data in the first place. So when we get these apparent conductivity measurements, it can be a little bit difficult to translate these directly into lithological uh, values, so or even values of interest, parameters of interest. So many relationships uh, in in publications they link apparent conductivity to texture or, or clay content, water content, but in many cases these relationships are quite uh, site specific because they can be uh, dependent on a lot of things. But the interest in inverting the data is actually to get a, to get a electrical conductivity that is, that is, can be then used to develop generalizable relationships. So, so the kind of, but then when, when we've got these models of electrical conductivity, then we're faced with the same challenges that we actually have with ERT. So we're left to interpret data in terms of Archie's law or Waxman-Smith models. So 
Yeah, it's the same sort of drivers, right? With prosody, water content, and play content. They're the main things linking electrical conductivity to to lithology and related parameters. Um, in phase, so in EMAGPI, we don't really use in phase values because these are more related to the magnetic susceptibility. And as I mentioned before, Guillaume and I were most interested in environmental parameters. So just now, no, we do not invert the electro, we do not invert the in phase values. Um, and the, so what's the source of the ERT data? So the ERT data needs to be collected at the same time as the as the frequency domain EM survey, essentially. So along the same profile. And basically, you can have like a vertical electrical sounding. You can have uh, I mean, do a trench, take salt samples, uh, because you're working in the critical zone, salt samples to get the electrical connectivity, or you can do a transect. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as you get like some resistivity data, a profile yeah. with depth that varies. That's true, yeah. So yes, oh yeah, I didn't read, I read the first part of your question, not the second. So yes, if you had a, a resistivity section for a borehole log, that could work. Um, I think an important thing to note is that it, um, for the devices we've been working with, we've got quite a shallow depth of investigation. So it depends how interest you're looking, how deep you're interested in looking, whether or not frequency domain EM will be the right tool for you. Okay. There are a couple questions that made its way into the chat itself. Oh, it's a different. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice. Um, I was wondering, should we just, um, I can just do the API in uh, 10 minutes and then we can continue QA? Sure. Yeah. That works for you, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So, in the meantime, if anyone thinks of any additional questions, feel free to throw them in the QA. Yep. Right. Okay. I'm showing last one. Okay. So, um, so in this repository of the MacPy, you also have like a uh, folder Jupyter notebooks, and there you have a few examples. And Paul, I've been showing you actually in the documentation online. You can also find these examples. And the idea is that uh, if you want to use the API, but you don't know which function to use and so on, you can actually look at there at what's been done uh, already. Um, and then basically copy past and then modify to 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 your liking. Uh, just to help as well on the website, if you go to the documentation, you have of course uh, the gallery of examples. But what you also have above is the API documentation. So it's a bit more dry, but basically uh, it tells you okay this function in the code it has these arguments and this is what to expect uh, as well. So it's like uh, a documentation for the Python string that you can you can find. Right, so here is uh, it's an example. They are online, so if you want to to follow up, uh, I've just opened uh, Jupyter Jupyter Lab for notebook, but you can open it in, in virtual uh, Visual Studio Code or uh, yeah, normal notebook stuff. Uh, at first, I'm just gonna import uh, the module. So here, I'm imported from source. I added the SRC folder to my uh, system path, and I import MacPy from it. If you did pip install uh, in MacPy, you can just, you don't need these two lines of code. You can just directly import it. Um, basically this example uh, aims to reproduce this, this uh, I mean, to try the forward model of this, this EC model. So we have an EC model with a connective layer on top of a resistive one. Uh, this is to build the model. So we define we have two layers, we have 30 position along the layers and then the depth are changing and so on. We define our instruments, uh, so similar way as is the IMAC by format. So we have an instrument here that has six code configurations, three VCP, three HCP. Uh, it's actually the configuration of the CMD Explorer from GF Instruments. Then we can generate synthetic data. Um, so first we instantiate the problem uh, class. So the problem class, we've actually imported it. Uh, if I go back up, this is what we import from IMACPy, and it's basically the class that's gonna make uh, where you're going to do all your, your computation. Okay, and then we're going to set the model. So given the depth we've defined above and the conductivity, we set the model, and then we compute the forward response with this forward model. Here's the cumulative sensitivity that we can choose FS clean and so on. Given this color configuration we've defined above, and you even have the option to add some noise. So if you want to simulate like field data. 
Um, and then you can show like show result in this case is showing you the EC model that have been imported. Okay, there's this one, and just the show function gives you the the apparent conductivity that that you have here. I run it at the same time. So the apparent conductivity is clearly following this, and you can see there is no noise. It's it's very clean. Okay, um, and so here we can try to invert. I'm not gonna go into the details there, but what we do for inversion, we actually set um, an initial model from it. Uh, and uh, so it's similar to the to the GUI, actually. We define some depth. Here we have just one depth, and we set it at first at 1.5 meters. In this case, we don't fix it. So we say fixed depth is false. So the depths we can vary in the inversion. It's a parameter of the inversions. We have two conductivities, 20, 20. Uh, and this one, of course, they will vary because we want to recover that. We use, uh, this is a solver, it's rope, um, it's a kind of CNC-based solver, so that's why we can get some idea of the of the errors using the zero bars a bit. The cumulative sensitivity, number of repetitions, uh, or alpha parameters, uh, and so on. You can also specify bounds. If you know you have an interface, uh, I mean, between about one and three meters, uh, and then the bounds of the conductivity, if you know you cannot get conductivity below zero or above, above 80, you can do it like this. Uh, and then the solver we run, and we have this progress bar, and then we get we get the results. Um, I'm not showing, but basically here it's all the code in one one cell. And so we have initial model, apparent, uh, produced, and the inverted ones. So it's really useful if you want to test. Okay, will I be able to see my layers uh, with this setup with this instrument if I put it on the ground? You can basically do this test here uh, virtually before going on the field and to see which is the best instrument for your case. Uh, what you could expect to recover in terms of, of model conductivity. So that's one of the notebook. Uh, and the other notebook, I just want to go quickly through it, is basically showing the application of a time-lapse, so to do time-lapse uh, measurements. So it's relatively similar. It uses some data from uh, a wheat uh, that's been collected on some wheat plots, at different dates you can see in 2017, uh, basically more or less every month. We import all the surveys, create time-lapse surveys, uh, and then exactly we'll the same, we set an initial model. Uh, and here, what we do a bit special is that we actually compute uh, the change in apparent conductivity because we are interested more in the change related to uh, the water uptake of the plants. And then we invert it using this, this specific forward model. Um, and then here we import as well the water contents, basically. And then we can have a figure like this at the end when we have basically the, the model of the EC, inverted EC. Okay, and then we have the model of the change. So we invert it for the change, and we have like if it's becoming red, it's make it, it's drier, it's well less conductive, um, and if it's becoming blue, it's more conductive uh, throughout the dates compared to this initial model. And if we look at the row below, that's the water content. Uh, what you can see is that with time we get some more reddish at the surface as the plants are taking up water and it's it really agrees with the so the conductivity at the top and the moisture content in the, in the bottom uh, and you can compute a relationship as well um something else i would like to mention so this is all a few ex examples like this uh, online I invite you to to look at and something i forgot to mention is that actually in the interface you have this option button on the top right uh, and then you can also look at the API log. And the API log is that basically the, 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 um, the, the interface have been using the API all along the way, but in the background, and you, you've not seen it uh, so far. But if we look at the log, you have actually all the function that you get uh, when, you've, uh, when, you've, when you've done this. So it's also quite nice to make the transition from the, from the grid to the, to the API. So you can see first we imported this, this cover crop uh, example, and then we basically we play a bit with the different show function, the show map function, and so on, with setting up the initial 20 layers model uh, with our uh, depth fixed and so on, and, and we show the different uh, uh, the misfit, the slice, and the 3D stuff. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show for, for the APM. All right. yeah. So open to questions now. All right. Um, I think we still have a few in the chat itself. Um, da, da, da. 
So you can use a magpie for geophysical exploration. Um, so for data electric resistivity of current obtained model. Okay, let's see here. Uh, so I think um, uh, another question about using a magpie um, to uh, determine a geologic profile related to electrical resistivity um, with the subsurface, like changing electrical resistivity in the subsurface. Um, so I guess also for like, yeah, geological investigation. Um, I think it was touched on a bit before. Uh, mm -hmm. what... Yeah, I think so. If, if it's the, is it the question at 517? Oh, sorry, I'm in a different time zone. So is it question at 17 minutes past the hour? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think so. So the, the devices that Guillaume and I have been working on, they've, they've got quite a short distance between the receiver and the transmitter. But I spoke to someone before and they were using, so you also get frequency domain systems where you can separate the, the coil, the two coils. So you can effectively do similar to a VES. So where you can actually dictate the spacing between the coils. And he wanted to do like a 1D um, sounding to uh, quite deep depths. And I, I think it, it was working. I don't remember to what depth, but in theory, if you've got this instrument where you can separate the coils, then you can you can start to get to depths where you you're seeing geologically re relevant units. So not just the not just the regolith or not just the soil horizons. Nice. Um, yeah. And then about hardware design. Mm. I'm not. That's not. That's not. I'm not. I'm not I'm, I don't know about this for frequency domain instruments, so I cannot help you there, unfortunately. But mm, I'm not sure if Guillaume has any input on that question about development of tools, hardware tools. No, not for frequency domain. The thing is that it's very uh, sensitive, from what I know. I know that some people are developing this in Unix, but they are they have like a lot of electrical engineers around them. Because you need to have this bucking cord between the transmitter and the receiver to cancel the, the field. It's, it's, um, it's very sensitive, but maybe it will come one day on this open hardware. <laughs> but I don't know any for now. All right, let's see here. Um, I have some recommendations on what kind of software you can use for time domain EM. Yeah. Do you have any input on that? Um, yeah, so so eMagpie is only frequency domain at the moment, but um, I, so I, I've been doing a lot of TEM now, and I, that's mainly using some software developed by Aarhus. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that called? Aarhus uh, in, in, Aarhus in, and that's um, free for, for researchers. You just need to apply for a license. Uh, I think we can also set, send out um, a link to that. Yeah. For there's a commercial version as well, um, but yeah, for research, this can be accessed for free. All right, um, Jim, I saw that you started to uh responding to David Allen's question, um, about yeah, can... yeah if you want to take that one, yeah, I can just reply. <clears throat> uh, for high magnetic suitability, so yeah, um, I mean, basically, in EMACPI, we don't we compute the interface, but we don't use it, so uh, if, if the magnetic sensitivity is something that is of interest uh, to you. You cannot use the magpie to invert for that. Uh, there is some, um, I mean, inside we use it. So if you want, you could dig in the code to try to extract the Ford model that computes it and then write your own code for that. There is also this uh, this link, uh, this package FDM1D that does compute, uh, mag I mean, that does, this is a forward model that computes an interface based on magnetic susceptibility. Um, but as far as I know from, Open source code, there is no inversion code for inverting in phase data. I think they're, they're quite pro, they're quite uh, prone to miscalibration, this, this instrument, this measurement. So it can be quite difficult to actually translate your raw data into quantitative models of magnetic susceptibility. So, as far as I understand, that's why it's typically not done, mainly yeah. because the values are good for producing maps, but not so good for uh, making models. Uh, inversion, inversion models. Yeah, there's just, I think, one case if you're on a very conductive ground, basically, you have like some of this, uh, this, the ECA and uh, I mean, the quadrature start to go down. And if you know the, the in phase, you can basically go back to the to where you are on the quadrature. So 
It's called the Robbie's TCA method. You can have a look to Google uh, this. Mm -hmm. And this is for very this is for very, very high conductivity. Yeah, yeah, it's very high. Yeah, above maybe a few thousand, no? A few yeah. thousand millisiemens per meter. So yeah. all right. Um I guess someone's asking about um kind of this thing Grim um EM yeah, method. I'm not sure if it's how eMagpie would handle that, but if y'all have any input on um Slingram EM stuff. Yeah. What's this thing called Slingram? I'm just trying to search quickly what is that. I don't know about this instrument. It looks interesting. <laughs> this, this, seems, this seems they're end domain instruments, though. Is that correct? No, yeah. it says frequency and spacing option. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not heard about this instrument. So. Yeah. I can look into it and we can, we can um, I'm, I'm sure there's some way we can pass out information after this uh, webinar is finished. Yeah, when in a MACPI you can invert uh, multi-frequency and multi -core. you can do it together. Just if you put the right headers, the code will do what is necessary to, to write, to get the right forward model, basically. So, yeah. And uh, for Sina, the parallel inversion is for, the parallel inversion is for multiple samples. Uh, so it inverts samples in parallel uh, for that. Just that. I think unless anyone else has any last minute questions they want to throw in there. Yeah. So yeah, I I guess the Slingram would work. Uh, but you and I have not looked at it before. So yeah, if you if you can try it, yeah, it'd be nice to see. Uh we have our uh, we have a hand raised. Um Obina, if you wanna unmute and ask a question. I, I was just uh, trying to uh, find out how uh, eMagPy can actually capture the time lapse, uh, uh, the time lapse uh, monitoring of uh, soil water content changes after a wetting or drying and drying section. Like maybe you're trying to uh, capture infiltration. Uh, how does that really work? I already saw the answer that it's possible. Is there a way you can throw some light on it and uh, I can uh, actually apply it to my research? If I just quick, quickly comment on this, uh, thank you for the question. So Imagpa itself is just the software to, to invert, uh, to invert uh, EMI data. And so if you want to look at uh, water infiltration or the water uptake by the plants, what we usually do is that we go on the field uh, every month and as it's coming and we do an EMI survey, and it is becoming drier, we have different data sets. Uh, and then we also collect at some locations soil moisture content to be able to link this drying to uh, decrease in soil moisture content. <clears throat> and that was what I was showing in the in this notebook. So if you look back uh, in the gallery online, you can find these notebooks and how these uh, are, are, are stitched together, basically. Um, there's also some links in the notebooks to papers that actually are doing that as well. So I would really recommend that uh, you have a look at this. Yeah, all right. So I think for I'll just add, add something as well. So yeah, we're assuming if the if the geology stays the same or the soil stays the same, it's only the the water content that's changing. So the Guillaume had a really nice experiment where the changing elect electrical conductivity is is mapping up with the water content. So I think yeah, that that's that's how it's working quite nicely. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, so I think we're a minute past time now. So I think um, unless someone has any other sweeping things, I'll uh, do our any little outro here. Um, I just have a, can I just have Chris a closing just one sentence? Of course. Um, 
just uh, for those who are interested in the in the GitLab, basically it's possible to uh, to raise issues. So um, we we don't want to do support by email, so we didn't put any emails there <laughs> basically in the presentation um, because we are just only two and we are pretty busy right now. <laughs> so, uh, but basically, if there is something in the software that uh, is not working for you or that you would like it to improve or if you would like to contribute, because that's an, the idea of the open source software that basically everybody can contribute. Uh, you are welcome to join the GitLab, and then you can, you know, do pull requests uh, to add some codes or raise some uh, some issue if you have feature requests there. So this is really how, how we work for collaboration on this on this project. That's it. Awesome. All right. So uh, thank you again to to Paul and Guillaume, uh, and thank you all for attending uh, the SET Near Surface Geophysics Technical Section Student Subcommittee's uh, Open Source Software Series webinar on eMagPi. Please respond to the webinar follow-up email that we'll be receiving uh, kind of within the next day or two after this. Let us know what you liked, what could be done better, um, any suggestions for future webinar topics. Um, in addition to this, we have a um, critical skills webinar series that goes through, you know, stuff like making a good pre presentation, uh, networking at conferences was a recent one. Um, so anything that you feel like uh, we could cover to help people let us know. Um, for people who are still interested in the open software stuff, we have another seminar, uh, another webinar next week, uh, this coming Monday. Um, Sina, who um, has been a little bit now here and then, um, is doing a follow up to his ResiPi uh, webinar that we did earlier, um, delving more into some of its functionalities um, and whatnot. So keep uh, anyone who has gotten an email about this should also be get have gotten an email about how to register for that one uh but yeah please look for all of our social media posts emails whatnot uh to register for future webinars and thank you all again um I'd like to thank all of you for attending and paul and game of course for taking the time and going through all of the e magpies functionalities so thank you yeah. thank you for having us and thank you for listening yeah thank you <laughs>